Cereal. Hey guys, it's Isaac, and I'm here with another episode of TikTok. Um, today's episode is going to be a little different. We have our first interview, the first interview that I've done, and I would like to continue to do more for this channel. I think that it's a great outlet to, you know, be able to see other people's sides of things, but I got a fantastic opportunity to interview Chris Ulmer, which is the YouTuber on Special Books by Special Kids, SBSK, which I'll link down below in the description. Um, he's a fantastic guy. He's funny to be around. He's, you know, great to have conversation with. And honestly, he's what this world lacks. He has the compassion and drive and, you know, for people with diagnoses. You know, he has that acceptance. You know, he, he doesn't care who you are, what you are. He wants to be your friend. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a fantastic guy. And, you know, I'm so glad that I got the opportunity to be able to interview him and share with you guys some of the questions that, you know, I had off the top of my head. And he, he doesn't, he doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter who you are. But he is a fantastic gentleman. And I hope that you guys enjoy this interview as much as I enjoyed doing it. He's also going to post the interview he did with me on his channel. So if you want to go check out his channel, please do. Um, if you're not already subscribed to him, please do. He's a great guy and he shares some fantastic stories. He goes everywhere telling different stories of people with different diagnoses. And, you know, I, I think that that is exactly what this world needs. Um, but before we head into the interview, don't forget to like and subscribe and turn that bell on so we can tell you when it's next time, next time it's time for TikTok. Um, but again, don't forget to go on over to SBSK and watch a few of his interviews. They're fantastic. All right, guys, I'll see you next time. Enjoy the interview. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Of course. What do you like the most about your job? I love getting to meet people and hearing their stories. And it's almost like every day I have personal growth. Cause like today I just sat and I heard your stories and there's things I relate to about it. And everybody has their own distinct experience. But no matter how different somebody's experience is than mine, I find something that I can relate to and connect to. So it's cool to see no matter how different somebody can be in the world and how different their experience can be, that still I think there's more similarities than there are differences. Um, do you ever want to go back to the classroom? You mentioned earlier that you were a special ed teacher. I love teaching. I love being in the classroom, but I love what I do now so much more. I would say the one thing I miss about being in the classroom is being able to see the impact you're having. Because when I do a video and I edit it and I put it up, it might get a lot of views and likes and there's great comments. And you even receive emails and this finite feedback, but you don't see it in the person. You don't see a child go from a kindergarten reading level to a fifth grade reading level in one year. Right. That's something that's really rewarding, and it's something that I don't get now. So if I was to get drawn back into teaching, it's because I miss that so much. But right now, I'm enjoying this too much. What is one regret that you have in making this your new job? My new job? One regret? Oh, my goodness. Um... I mean, I'm sure I've done lots of things wrong. I know I've made lots of mistakes. I could tell you a lot of mistakes I made, but I make sure to not make the same mistake twice. I'm always learning and always growing. And I think that's part of being a teacher, having that growth mentality and thinking that, okay, I'm allowed to make mistakes, but once I make that mistake, let's put something, some kind of precaution in the air so that I don't make the same mistake again. So that way, mistakes are just one way you get stronger. So because of that, I don't really have any regrets. Good. But lots of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> 
So where do you see yourself with this channel in 10 years? It's so funny to measure your success just by number of followers and views, but really, so say I put up your interview and millions of people see it, that's millions of people who now understand what you're going through. They understand a little bit more about schizophrenia and Tourette's. So really, my, my idea, my vision, my goal is just to build our community to as large of a number as possible so that more people are learning about these conditions. Good. I like that. And then, you know, watching your videos and seeing how far you've come, because I've went back and watched from your classroom videos. Those are some fun ones. Those are some good ones. And, you know, watching your videos and seeing how far you've come, I've seen the impact, you know, just, just reading people's comments and seeing, you know, you've made an impact on my life. Thank just, you. Just watching those videos. How, to people, to people with different disorders, what is your message for them? Just be you. Thank you for sharing your story with so many people. I think acceptance is the number one thing. You have to accept who you are. You have to accept your present state before you can build on it. I, um, whenever I talk to teachers or I give a lecture, I use a very physical example. I go to a set of steps. Usually you have to walk up steps to get to the stage. And I'll go to step three or four. And I'll say, everybody in life is on a certain step. Socially, you're on a, a certain step with your social skills. Academically, you're on a certain step. And me being an adult, I'm on a higher step than a child because I've had 30 years to learn and grow. That's just natural. That's part of life. But if I take that child and just assume they're on the same step as me, if I bring them up to step four, when they haven't built the foundation because they're not as old as me, they haven't gone through the same experiences, they're just going to crumble because they don't have anything underneath them. They're going to fall, they're going to get hurt, and then they're going to be afraid to climb up the steps again because they associate it with pain. So my number one piece of advice, if you have a diagnosis, if you don't, but it really is just accept where you are, even if it's not where you want to be, because you have to accept where you are in order to build and take steps up. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. Do you, you know, you've gone everywhere a lot of places. A lot of places. And you've seen a lot of really good souls mm -hmm. and a lot of good people and asked them how they can be, how you can be their friend. Yeah. How can we be your friend? The same answer everybody says to me, just say hi, I'm friendly. Yeah, I'll never, whenever somebody comes up to me and says hi and says, oh, I like your videos, I'm always happy to have a conversation. It's funny, people always start telling me the details of an interview because you know there's so many interviews and it's hard to remember all the names they'll be like oh it was that guy and this was his story and he he was wearing this and I always know the names <laughs> so I'm, pr I'm proud of remembering the names when people tell me the story do you would you ever see yourself making an event to where all these people that you've met could come and meet Yes, that's something that a lot of people have suggested to me. And it's something we've done where we started in Jacksonville, because our first 20 or 30 interviews that were outside of the classroom were in Jacksonville, and we've done get-togethers there. But when you start to think of inviting everybody we've met, it becomes a bit of a logistical nightmare, because that includes Canada, USA, Mexico, Australia, England, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland. And then you think about, where are we going to have this? How are we going to invite everybody? In the beginning, I wasn't keeping the best records of everybody I interviewed. What if we forget somebody? Will they feel like we did it on purpose? So it is something that I think would be so neat. But right now, I'm just afraid to tackle it because there's so much on our plate already. And it's just a logistical nightmare. That Yeah, I can understand that. If you ever need help, I'm here. Thank you. Of course. Maybe we could start just nationally with a, a USA meetup. Mm -hmm. and just do one of the major cities, I think that would be something more tangible. Chicago's right in the middle. Yeah, here in the Midwest. <laughs> um, so, for anybody that's struggling to find friends and is having a hard time being themselves, what do you suggest? You have to accept it. 
you have to accept that, hey, you might have a little bit of social anxiety. Then start analyzing why you have it. What are your triggers? Do you feel that in certain situations? Do you feel it all the time? Are there certain times when it's lessened? Why is it lessened in those certain times? Maybe it's lessened when you're doing your favorite activity, listening to music. Maybe you go and play volleyball and you find you can socialize with anybody in that moment. So you create a life around your strengths. Serial. Me personally, I um, I like to socialize, but I don't like to go out to loud bars. I can't hear anybody. I have a hard time socializing in that type of environment. And that's what people in their 20s do. Mm -hmm. They go to bars, but to me that's just uncomfortable. So I started playing volleyball, and I found that I love volleyball. And then I found that volleyball is a really social sport, and people like to talk and hang out and just sit on the beach. So I made my whole social life centered around volleyball. That's awesome. So I would say if you have trouble finding friends, find what you love first, and then find friends who love the same thing, and then build your life around that. So you said you've spent three years doing this. You're coming up on three years. If you include the first year in the classroom, it's four years. Four years. So for that first year teaching, we were doing the blog, but teaching was my primary concern. I wanted the students to progress academically and socially, and I was teaching them, and the blog was just a side project. Three years this April, I will have been doing this full time and nothing else, just this. Would you have done anything differently to get where you are? Mm, I mean, if I could give myself the knowledge I have now <laughs> and just implant it in my mind back then, I would because I believe I've become a better filmer, a better interviewer. But that's just part of the progress, you know, accepting where this, the step you're on. There's nothing I would really do different, no. For anybody that's watching, what would you like to see for the world in five years, five, ten years? What would you like to see for the world for people with disabilities? People always write to me and they ask, how can I volunteer with SBSK? How can I get involved? And I've intentionally kept everything really close to me. I do all the editing, I do all the filming. You saw the process today. It's just me and a tripod and the person I'm interviewing. There's not really much a volunteer can do. Yeah. And I just respond to those people and I tell them the best way to volunteer is, a lot of these people are in high school who reach out. I say, go to your high school lunchroom, look for the one person who's sitting alone and go sit with them and have lunch, become their friend, invite them to sit with your friends, make a friend who looks like they don't have any friends. That's how you volunteer with me. So I would say my, my hope for the world is that everybody sees other people as potential friends. Everybody needs potential friends. Exactly. Everybody needs friends. Were you ever in a situation like that where you didn't have anybody? Not, ver not really. I, I had a good family growing up. I wasn't the most popular guy in high school, but I had a good group of friends. I was on the soccer team. But um, I always wanted to be friends with everybody. I mean, everybody to the point where I was hanging out with the kids who might have been doing the bad things, but I didn't do the bad things. I was just interested in them. I wanted to know why they did that. Why do they decide to do that? I was, I was friends with the kids who were the really smart kids. I was just a friend, you know? Yeah. No, but I would say that I've moved a lot since I turned 18, just going city to city and doing different jobs, and I've done that intentionally, just to experience as much as possible. So through that process, I know what it's like to go somewhere new and not know anybody. And it's terrifying. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Even as a 30 year old man, the idea of uprooting is terrifying. I completely understand that. If you had to move anywhere outside of Florida, where would you go? <sighs> it's tough. So I, I grew up in Philadelphia. So I, I got the big, the big city thing. I lived in Kentucky for a few years. So I got the rural mountain thing. I went to a big college. I went to Penn State, so I experienced that. And now I've lived on the beach for five years in Florida. So honestly, I don't know what's left in the USA. I've been to over 40 states. I think I would have to look internationally. My favorite um, city I've ever visited was Perth, Australia. Oh. So I might move to Perth, Australia. 
I mean, I'm not going to, but if I, if I, if I had to, I think I might choose Perth. That, I love Australia. It's, it's a cool it's, place. It's a very beautiful place. Nice people, too. Yes. Now, uh, most animals there can kill you. But, but the people here can kill you. Yeah, the people here can kill you. <laughs> so pick your poison. <laughs> well, what do you have to say for the people watching? Subscribe to this channel. Subscribe to Isaac's channel. It's going to be eye-opening. And thank you for watching the very first video on his channel.